uh, welcome to FAT Store and welcome to our tutorial on explainable AI in industry. Uh, so th this is uh, joint work with um, Krishna Gade, uh, uh, Sahin Gaik, uh, Varun Mithal, and uh, Ankur Tali. Uh, so my name is Krishna Ram Kentapadis. I am from the AWS Machine Learning Platform team. Uh, along with me here today is uh, Sahin Gaik. Uh, and uh, Ankur Tali. Um, so before we get started, just a show of hands. Uh, how many of you are from uh, uh, academia? Uh, and how many uh, students? Uh, how many from um, industry? Okay, great. I think we have a very nice mix of uh, people uh, from industry, students, professors, and so forth. Um, so let's start with um, what do we mean uh, by uh, explainable AI. So today, uh, as we all know, the machine learning models have become very complex in the form of, say, uh, deep neural networks with uh, several layers or even simpler models with uh, lots of no parameters that it has become quite often than not uh, very difficult to explain the predictions of a machine learning model. So as a result, when the AI system behaves like a black box, uh, there are challenges as to uh, for anyone, for the users of the system to understand why the model made some pr prediction, uh, why, did, why did the model not make certain other prediction, uh, what, what are the reasons or the cases where the model failed, what are the failure modes, how to improve the model, how to recover from failures and so forth. And with the explainable AI, we want to uh, pr provide exactly, uh, address exactly these issues. So we, we would like to provide mechanisms to understand why the model behaves in a certain manner, uh, why a specific prediction has been made uh, for, for understanding the model as a whole, uh, to help the various stakeholders to improve the model or to uh, ensure that the model is compliant, so on and so forth. Let's start with some of the motivation from the business perspective. So if you look at the different stakeholders involved with an AI or machine learning system, um, it, it black box AI creates uh, challenges for many of the stakeholders. For example, if for a business owner uh, would like to understand whether the, they can trust the decisions made by the AI system. In the case of, say, the model developers or data scientists, uh, they might want to understand how to improve the model, which features are important, and so forth. In the case of, say, IT or operations, they might want to understand how to monitor the model, uh, debug the model, how to understand whether the distributions are evolving over time, is the model behaving differently than it's expected, and so forth. And f finally, for um, even uh, regulators or auditors, they would like to understand whether the model has any biases. Is it uh, fair? Uh, is it compliant with various regulations, and so forth? So given uh, this motivation, um, we have, it's not surprising that we have seen lots of uh, challenges in, um, in, in uh, and news articles around uh, black box AI. Even most recently, some of the challenges that um, uh, Apple's uh, credit card faced with regard to gender bias, or even going back a few years uh, back uh, around challenges that, say, uh, chatbots, or even facial uh, analysis softwares have gone through. Um, and, the, and also, if you look at the explainability from a modeling perspective, there are lo lots of motivations as well. Um, so the simplest of this is uh, to debug the model. Uh, here is an example of a machine learning system which uh, predicted that the image on the left uh, is a clog, a type of shoe. <laughs> Uh, and of course, we would like to understand why did the network, the deep, deep neural network, label this image as clog. This can help uh, the data scientists and machine learning engineers. It's also more broadly, they, it, um, explainability can help the modelers to figure out how to improve the model. Uh, for example, it can help them understand which features are most important or even which parts of the training data are most important, and so forth. And this can help the, to provide human oversight and uh, human intuition on top of what 
the machine learning model can do best. At the same time, uh, another, yet another motivation is to check whether the model is respecting uh, various uh, safety constraints. Uh, this becomes especially important in the case of um, uh, high stakes uh, applications. Um, yes, for example, applications such as uh, autonomous driving or even healthcare where somebody's life might be at risk. Uh, here the challenge is to understand is the model uh, behaving in a safe manner or can we understand the failure modes of the model and having understood those failure modes can we ensure that the, uh, there are mechanisms to get around those failure cases. Uh, for example, in the case of autonomous driving, if you understand that the model may not uh, behave in certain uh, regions to, even, to uh, uh, for example, when there are no uh, signs or traffic signs, we can potentially have a override. We can pr signal to the humans to take control in those kind of scenarios. There are also benefits of explainability from the perspective of uh, learning new insights. Um, a re recent example is um, the case of the machine learning models behaving better than humans for uh, games such as Go. Here uh, we have even seen codes such as um, that uh, the machine is behaving or coming up with moves that even humans may not have thought of. This can help uh, us as humans to improve or learn about uh, new insights. And similarly, like if you think of uh, settings like uh, understanding brains, we, it, uh, we can potentially make use of machine learning models to figure out how to uh, learn about the b b brain behaves or understand it, it can co help us complement by providing insights that we may not have thought of otherwise. Uh, at the, so far we discussed about um, uh, uh, the benefits of explainability from the perspective of uh, the business or product needs, also from the perspective of modeling uh, angles. Here, at the same time, there's also benefits for explainability or in fact need for explainability from the perspective of uh, uh, re regulatory needs. Um, for a long time, there have been several laws against uh, discrimination. In, in United States, for example, many of these uh, laws date back to uh, the time of the civil rights movement. There have been various laws regulating and requiring not discriminating on the basis of uh, gender, race, uh, age, disability status and so forth. And more uh, recently we have seen a renewed interest uh, in this field with the arrival of uh, recent regulations such as uh, European Union's uh, GDPR um, as well as uh, for subsequent regulations such as California's uh, uh, Consumer Privacy Act, uh, regulations in finance sector and so forth. Usually we tend to associate these regulations primarily with privacy because uh, the, sometimes the word privacy or protection, data protection is present as part of the regulation. But if you look carefully, it turns out that these regulations also pertain about related dimensions like fairness, uh, transparency and explainability. Um, so, for example, if we look at uh, uh, GDPR, uh, the Article 22 it discusses the n needs of a system and uh, alludes to the right to explanation in the case of uh, automated uh, decision making processes. Uh, there is also a description about uh, what we mean by profiling and what are the uh, requirements when if personal data is collected about individuals and the individuals are tracked and so forth. Um, for, further, if you think of um, uh, more broadly, there, there have also been subsequent regulations uh, adopted in different states in the United States yeah, and also similar regulations that are being pursued by uh, countries such as Australia, Brazil, India and so forth. And, and specifically, if you think of, um, say, the finance sector, uh, there have been regulations uh, such as the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, as well as uh, regulations like SR 117, which uh, pertain to um, understanding about model risk, model governance, and so forth. So given all these uh, motivations, given the motivation from uh, the business angle, from modeling, 
and from the regulatory aspects it's i hope it's clear that um, explainability is very important in while developing machine learning systems uh, if 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 we think of uh, machine learning systems if, uh, we would like to think of or we, we would like to incorporate explainability by design by this we mean that we want to incorporate explainability as part of all stages of the machine learning system uh, for example if you think of uh, training we want to understand uh, how the model performs as a ho whole is the model uh, biased in certain aspects uh, how what are the most important uh, features of the model and so forth and then when we think of the testing or um, uh, QA stage of the model, we want to understand is, is it compliant with the various regulations. And once it is deployed um, or during deployment, we want to understand um, what are the, does it meet the criteria uh, needed for deployment. And later, uh, when the model is making individual predictions, we would like to understand why the model made specific predictions. Um, okay, explained for for instance where if a model for deciding whether to lend to someone uh, makes a prediction we want to understand why the model uh, either denied or accepted the lending uh, criteria and ways in which uh, as an individual user can uh, one can help to improve their uh, uh, subsequent decision and likewise, when it uh, it's also important in other related stages such as uh, A/B testing or uh, monitoring and uh, and also to provide feedback to help us continuously improve the model. Um, so, with this motivation, let's also look into uh, the challenges uh, when we think of explainability at scale. Uh, the scale can mean uh, many things. For example, if you take an example such as uh, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has been building the world's largest economic graph, uh, which consists of uh, more than half a billion members with uh, several millions of open jobs, uh, companies, several tens of thousands of skills, schools, and so forth. Given the scale of data, several uh, tera petabytes of data are being analyzed uh, nearline and offline every day, and all the decisions are made based on uh, hundreds of A-B testing experiments. Yeah, and there are also there are several uh, dozens of uh, machine learning models which are deployed in production. And so the ch the challenge here is how do we incorporate explainability or fairness at this scale? How do we uh, uh, think in terms of the the interoperability of uh, decisions, the interactions between the decisions made by different systems? How do we think in terms of uh, the experience that the users of the system face, wherein any one product might incorporate um, decisions made by several different models. So another aspect of scale is um, when we think of, say, uh, machine learning platforms. Uh, for example, if we look at platforms such as uh, AWS, uh, we have several layers wherein we provide uh, different types of support, various types of frameworks. Uh, as an example, uh, close to 85% of uh, TensorFlow models in the cloud are being run on AWS. And similarly, there are all other frameworks like PyTorch, MXNet, and so forth. There are also, we also have tools for uh, both collecting training data, training machine learning models, uh, deploying and monitoring models, and so forth. And there are also various uh, uh, AI services which are at the built on top, uh, so ranging from services related to vision, speech, uh, text extraction, uh, forecasting, fraud, and so forth. So here the challenge is that uh, there are several different types of services and uh, uh, model uh, model learning or model development tools. So we need to provide tools for explainability and fairness that cater to a wide range of customers of the system. Different customers might have different uh, needs. So how do we build tools in platforms uh, like this where we cater to the needs of several different classes of customers? So we give a, th these are some of the challenges that we as uh, industry practitioners face uh, every day with regard to explainability and fairness. Um, so with this, um, let me uh, briefly allude to different 
types of uh, or different approaches to explainable AI. The first approach uh, is uh, one where there may be a black box AI model and we want to provide post hoc explanations given such a model. This can either be at the time of individual predictions where we want to uh, provide explanations for each individual uh, prediction made by the model due, uh, once the model has been deployed or it can be to understand the model as a whole where we want to provide uh, global explanations for the model. There have been several different techniques proposed for each of these. Uh, the second approach is um, one where we would want to build an interpretable model itself instead of having an explainable, having a black box model and providing explanations post hoc, we would instead want to build an interpretable model. There, are, there have also been several different uh, techniques uh, proposed uh, along this line. Uh, we can kind of broadly uh, think of the, the, the current techniques available for explainability in this uh, kind of cheat sheet. Uh, just a disclaimer that this may not be covering all the techniques uh, that are out there. But on the left, box here, the pink box on the left, uh, we have techniques which, uh, 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 which are about developing intrinsically explainable models. So this is uh, for, uh, belonging to the second approach I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, at the bottom left, we have techniques which are, uh, which are designed for providing post hoc explanations at typically at the prediction level. And at, uh, in the box on the right, we have techniques which are pro uh, for providing explanations for the model as a whole. Uh, with this, let me uh, uh, invite Ankur to pre present the first case study uh, on explainable AI. Hey, thanks, Krishnam. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Ankur. Uh, so I work at uh, Fiddler Labs, which is a small startup uh, trying to do explainable AI. Uh, later in the tutorial, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what Fiddler is and what we are building at Fiddler. Uh, in this session, I'll focus on some work that I did before joining Fiddler at Google uh, on uh, debugging machine learning models using explainability. So all of the work I'm going to present now is in collaboration with colleagues at Google. And uh, I'll describe a particular explainability technique, and then I'll, I'll explain, I'll discuss how we apply that to a variety of debugging use cases. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the flavor of explainability for the next few slides is going to be uh, post hoc explanations for individual predictions. So in particular, you have a machine learning model. It makes a certain prediction, and you ask the question, why did it make this prediction? So here you have an image of a fireboat. The model calls this, the top label for this image is a fireboat. So now why is this a fireboat? You know, what aspect of this image makes it a fireboat? Is it the bridge? Is it the sky? Is it the water under the bridge? Is it the fireboat itself? You know, what is used, what is relied upon by the model in coming up with this prediction? More interesting one is this example that Krishna Ram shared. You know, this is an image of a boy with a binocular in his hands, and, but it's, called, it's labeled as a clog, which is that kind of shoe. So why is this a clog? Uh, now, these why questions are really open-ended, so we want to pin it down to something concrete that we can solve. Uh, one problem statement here is the attribution problem. So we want to understand why did it make this prediction. We phrase the problem as let's attribute this prediction to the input features such that the attribution to each feature is proportional to the contribution of that feature to the prediction. So you can think of it as feature importances. You know, you want to know what is the role played by, you want to quantify the role played by each individual feature in a particular prediction. So in an object recognition image classification model, you would attribute the prediction to pixels of the image. In a text model, you'll attribute it to words in the text. In, let's say, if you have a model with tabular data, let's say a lending model with features like income, mortgage, debt to income ratio, you'll attribute to those features. You know, what is the role played by, how important is the income feature to this particular lending prediction? Now, this is a very reductive formulation of the why question. You know, it doesn't tell you how the features interact. It doesn't tell you what the logic is that's employed by the network. It is sort of boiling down this why the prediction to how important is the feature. But it's surprisingly useful. 
so let's see. So how do we solve this problem? So if your model, if you had a linear model, now the contribution of a feature to a linear model's prediction is is the feature value times the feature coefficient. Right? That's the that's the amount that going that's going into the logic. Now, so how do we apply this method to a nonlinear model? So in a nonlinear model, the analog of a feature coefficient is the first derivative of the prediction with respect to that feature. So if you apply if you apply this linear model idea, you attribute a nonlinear model by looking at the feature value times the first derivative of the output by that feature. So dy by dxi for the ith feature. Uh, more mathematically, this is a first order Taylor approximation of the nonlinear model. So, so another way to say it is you take the first order Taylor approximation of the nonlinear model, so you get a linear model, and then you explain it using the methods we are familiar with for linear models. Uh, so we apply this idea to this to this fireboat image. So that image on the right is the is the attributions from this method. So the way we produce the image on the right is we take the original image and we scale every pixel. We scale the brightness of every pixel with the attribution it receives. So the brighter the pixel, the higher the attribution. And the black pixels are ones that get very little attribution. Now, this is a bit surprising, right? Uh, you see that <coughs> most of the attribution is falling onto all the pixels below the bridge. That's a bit surprising because that, in, in our eyes at least, that's not what a fireboat is. Right? The fireboat is more that boat down there and the water spouts. Why is everything under the bridge called a fireboat? So two things might be happening. So one, it could be that this model does reason that way. Whenever it sees a bridge and some water below it, it says fireboat. Or it could be that this, this attribution method is somewhat flawed. So in this case, fortunately, it turns out to be the latter. Uh, so what this feature times gradient is doing is it's examining sort of the sensitivity of the prediction at this particular image. So you have this large nonlinear model, it's a huge input space. We're just examining the, the we're just probing the model on one input. Let's, let's try to probe it on multiple inputs. In particular, what we tried is we reduced the brightness of this image all the way to a black image. So the x-axis is that same image scaled down by brightness. The y-axis is the score for the fireboat label. So now, at the original image, you have a score of 1.0. It's 100% it's fireboat in the eyes of the model. The black image is 0% fireboat. Now, if you notice, somewhere midway it jumps. On the previous slide, we were examining the gradients at the input. So we were looking at the gradients. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. So we were looking at the gradients over here. But the network is largely flat over here. Right? There is not much change in the prediction. It's already 100% sure that it's a fireboat. So those gradients are uninteresting. Instead, the more interesting gradients are here, where you have some amount of activity in the network. You know, here, when I move the pixel, when I increase the brightness of the pixels, I see a jump in this fireboat prediction. These are the gradients I want to capture. So this picture sort of gives us our method. What we do is we scale the input on a straight line path from the input at hand to a certain baseline input. Think of the baseline as a black image. So let's take the image at hand and a baseline image. Let's draw a straight line path in the image space. And let's take the gradients at all these points and average them. Or more formally, we take the path integral of the gradients along this, along this straight line path. And that's the method, which is called integrated gradients. Uh, it was published in uh, ICML 2017. So now when we apply integrated gradients to this image, you get the attributions on the right. So these are much more meaningful, at least to us, right? Uh, you can see the water spouts, spouts getting highlighted. You can see the boat getting highlighted. Uh, so before jumping into other applications, let me tell you a little bit about what this baseline is. So to apply the integrated gradients method, we need to scale the image from the original image to this baseline input. So what is the baseline? The baseline is some sort of an information-less input that we diff against. So what we're explaining is the prediction at the input at hand relative to a certain baseline prediction. So you want to pick a baseline that is neutral in the eyes of the network, that is like empty. Now, I'd argue that baselines are essential to any explanation. 
In fact, when we humans engage in explaining events, we always formulate the explanation by contrasting the event, the event to a certain normal event. Right? And this idea actually comes from, this is a classic idea in cognitive psychology uh, called norm theory. So a famous example is uh, a man suffers from indigestion. Now the doctor blames it to a stomach ulcer because the doctor says that all my patients who don't have the ulcer don't complain of indigestion. So it must be the ulcer. The wife blames it on eating turnips. She says that, you know, the days he doesn't eat turnips, he doesn't complain of indigestion. So it must be the turnips. Both these explanations are valid except they are relative to different baselines. The doctor is sort of applying a different lens of normality. The wife is applying a different lens of normality. So this, this what is normal plays a huge role in what explanations you derive. Okay, so, so back to fun stuff. So why is this a clog? So these are the, this is what integrated gradients tells you. Uh, so those are the pixels that are highlighted. If you kind of squint at it, you can see the shoe emerging. So it's like an optical illusion to the network. Here's another interesting example. So this is a network uh, that was built at Google to classify drug molecules. Uh, so, so each molecule is this, you have an organic chemistry, you know, orga organic mole molecule with carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens like that. Uh, you featureize it, you feed it to a network, and the network will tell you whether it binds to a certain protein or not. So we applied attributions to explain these protein binding predictions, and we attributed down to features and bonds, the atoms and bonds, sorry. What we noted is that those five ca carbon atoms obtain identical attribution, so they're exactly the same. Uh, that's a bit surprising. So if you notice the, the three carbon atoms to the right, they are bonded to other carbons, whereas these carbons are bonded to oxygen. So it can't be that they're all, all five of them are playing identical role in the network. So this actually turned out to be an implementation bug. Uh, what was going on is, so this was a convolutional network. So the atoms were featureized and the bonds were featureized. Then they were fed to some convolution layers and then to a hidden layer. There was a, there was a coding bug. So the convolution, the bond convolutions never really made it up top. So the, the, the model was solely relying on the atom convolutions. It had great predict, predictive accuracy still. Uh, but it was not using the bond features at all. And sort of that explains why all these five carbons are getting the same attribution, right? Because the model is simply acting on atoms, and they're all, at, they're all carbons. So this is sort of a bug we caught through attributions that your test accuracy doesn't quite catch. Here's a more interesting example. So <clears throat> this is a network trying to predict uh, various lung disorders from chest x-rays. This particular image is labeled as, as cancer. So we applied integrated gradients to see, okay, what about this image makes it cancer in the eyes of the network? And you find, you know, those pixels, the red pixels that are highlighted. So we are excited by this finding. We go to a radiologist saying, do you recognize a pattern here? You know, is this some sort of a pathology that the network has identified? Uh, now the radi radiologist zooms in and says that the region that's highlighted is actually where you already have two pen marks on the image. So what's going on here is that uh, these are real patient images that the model was trained on. The ones that did have cancer were already annotated by the radiologist. The model basically learned to detect radio radiologist markings, uh, which is a perfectly good predictor of cancer. Uh, and so it did very well on all the held out test sets. Uh, but uh, when, when you apply, exp, exp, this is how sort of explainability, this is where explainability shines. It tries to probe at the reasoning employed, and so you can sort of see when it's right for the wrong reason. Uh, so then after this, they cleaned all the data, they got unannotated data, and then they retrained the model. Let's move to natural language tasks. So let's take question answering. So there are three popular question answering tasks. There is uh, tabular question answering, image question answering, and paragraph question answering. In each case, you have a natural language question and a certain context. It could be a table, image, or a paragraph. And the model has to answer that question given the context. So this is tabular question answer. You can ask how many medals did India win, and then you consult the model will consult the table and come up with an answer. Now, in all question answering tasks, you know, when humans engage in question answering, when you do a homework or a test, the first thing up top is, you know, read the question carefully. 
So let's try to see if these models really read the question carefully. Let's pick visual question answer. So for this image, the question is how symmetrical are the white bricks on either side of the building? The answer is very, which is the right answer. The model is supposed to pick the answer from a given set of answer words. I picks the right one here. But does it really understand this question? So we use attributions. Since we are focused on understanding the question, we pick a baseline, which is the empty question, but the full image. So there is no diff with respect to the image. The baseline also has the image in full. The only diff is with respect to the question. So essentially, we are going to explain this prediction by attributing to question words. These are the attributions you receive. Uh, so red is positive, blue is negative, gray is near zero. One thing you'll notice is that this word symmetrical, which is a crucial adjective in the sentence, gets near zero attribution. So how come the model doesn't rely on this word? So let's probe that. So what if I change it to how asymmetrical are the white bricks on either side of the building? It will still say very. How big are the white bricks on either side of the building? It still says very. How fast are the white bricks speaking on either side of the building? It will still say very. So this is another example of why you know, test accuracy doesn't, doesn't quite cut it. You need some form of explainability to uncover these blind spots. Uh, so in this line of work, what we did is we used explainability to craft adversarial examples to fool the network. Uh, here's another one. So, so the attack here is, let's change the subject of the question with a low attribution word. So this ought to change the meaning, right? Because the subject has changed. To, to, so to us humans, the meaning of the sentence would have changed. And so you expect the model's answer to change as well. So if you have like, if the question is, what is the man doing, we'll make it, what is the tweet doing? Where tweet is a word that typically receives very low attribution in this model. How many children are there? How many tweets are there? So it turns out that this VQA model's predictions remains the same 75% of the time. So 75% of the time, if you perturb the, 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 the subject word, there is no effect on the model. Uh, so we had a paper at ACL last year, or last to last year, on these, uh, on these attacks. Uh, there are several attacks we found. Uh, the, 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 the general attack vector is, uh, you identify words that ought to receive large attribution but don't. So you play around with those words to fool the network. Or you pick words that receive attribution but shouldn't. For instance, stop words. Uh, we found that the, the, the tabular question answering model would often pay attention to, to stop words in the question. And so we, we crafted phrases that use those stop words that to us mean, not, don't mean much. So for example, we'll, so if the question is, uh, how many children were there? We'll make it next tell me how many children were there. Where these next tell me is like a meaningless phrase. But that would fool the network. So there are a bunch of these attacks that we found. Uh, all right, so I'll stop here and I'll invite Krishnaram again for the next case study. By the way, are there questions uh, at this point? Okay. Oh, thanks, Ankur. Uh, so next we are going to uh, discuss a case study where which emphasizes that uh, topics like explainability and uh, fairness are very closely interrelated and also uh, alludes to the fact that explainability doesn't have to be only in the context of, say, uh, a machine learning model prediction. So here uh, we're going to discuss the, uh, the project around providing diversity insights as part of LinkedIn's uh, talent solutions platform. Um, so f for when we were working on this, uh, the guiding principle for us was that we would like to in have diversity by design. By this we mean we would like to incorporate diversity insights into existing products at LinkedIn as opposed to building separate uh, products focused on say diversity in hiring. Um, and what did this involve? If you think of the hiring uh, products and the stages of hiring, uh, roughly there are, there are at least three stages. So there is the first stage uh, around planning. This is the time when, let's say, a company or 
a group is deciding where to source talent from uh, or even where to locate their next um, uh, headquarters or next branch. Uh, this is the stage at which uh, they would like to understand um, uh, how is the talent distributed by location, by industry, uh, and so forth. And at this point, we provide insights to help identify diverse talent pools. At the second stage is um, uh, during the time of hiring itself. This is the time when a recruiting, uh, a recruiter or a hiring manager has a specific job in mind and they are trained to identify candidates relevant for that job posting. And finally, once somebody has been hired, there, there is also a need to uh, train people on uh, implicit bias and so forth. So there is, a, there is LinkedIn provides a, a learning curriculum around diversity at, the, at that stage. So I'm going to mostly focus on the first two where um, it will become clear how even providing some of these insights helps uh, the user to understand the system better. Uh, let's start with uh, the planning stage. So this is a stage where uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we provide insights on the distribution of talent. So one of the elements that we added was to provide insights on how the talent is distributed by gender. Uh, this might be helpful for uh, say recruiters or other decision makers to to identify if they want to improve say diversity in their workforce w w uh, which industries should they source talent from or which locations or which skill sets have more uh, diversity uh, there is also a, a related aspect where we, we we describe how the diversity of uh, the the talent pool at the company the employees at the company compares with other companies or even how the diversity varies across different uh, function groups within the same company. Um, then uh, so, so fi finally like sometimes even providing insights on uh, user behavior or, uh, could also be very helpful. So, so this is a uh, um, yeah, screenshot of a yeah, yeah, tool that provides statistics on um, the responses to a recruiter's outreaches. So, so emails refer to uh, a message that a recruiter sends to a potential candidate. And here, in addition to d giving statistics on the response rate um, and so forth, we, we also decided to provide the distribution by gender. Th this could be helpful for a recruiter or a, even a company to identify uh, potential uh, blind spots. The, there might be, for example, the wording used in a recruiter's message may not appeal to all groups equally. Yeah, and the, the, uh, this to, uh, tools like this could be a way towards helping uh, even understand that there are such issues. So this is again an example where it, the, uh, the provided insights are essentially analytics, so there's no machine learning involved here. But at the same time, this could be uh, useful, just like explainability in the machine learning setting. Um, so given uh, uh, these insights, we also wanted to tie that with uh, the experience that a recruiter or hiring manager would uh, uh, see at the time of hiring itself. Uh, so this is the a yes, hypothetical screenshot of uh, the LinkedIn recruiter tool. This is a tool that is used when a recruiter wants to identify candidates with uh, specific titles or skills, lo uh, candidates from specific locations, companies, and so forth. They can search, they can issue free form searches as well as uh, uh, filter by various facets. Here we took the position that we, we would like the top results to be reflective of the distribution of the underlying talent pool. So as an example, le let's suppose that um, the, the talent pool of UX designers in Barcelona is distributed in a certain percentage by gender. We wanted to ensure that even the top results we reflect the same distribution. So this has a uh, yeah, few benefits. So one benefit is that it provides a consistent experience with uh, what 
uh, the recruiter would have seen using the previous tool I mentioned when they are planning and when they are trying to identify what is the d uh, distribution of gender in different uh, industries or titles and so forth. Um, and the second is that uh, we are ensuring that the results of LinkedIn models do not uh, deviate from the underlying talent pool distribution. Um, so I'll go a little bit into uh, why we chose this approach and the, the key intuition that we used here. Um, so the, as I mentioned, the intuition here is that um, the top ranked results should follow a certain desired distribution uh, on um, attributes such as uh, gender, age, or different combinations of uh, protected categories. Um, and uh, in one way to instantiate this might be that uh, that desired distribution is set to be the, dis the distribution of the underlying talent pool for that query. But, but we could also potentially uh, come up with this desired distribution through a legal mandate or a voluntary commitment and so forth. So this, this was a lesson that we learned while working on this was that uh, notions like explainability or fairness are intrinsically uh, socio-technical. So which means that it requires inputs from several different stakeholders. So people with, um, uh, so of course, inputs from LinkedIn's uh, end users, members, LinkedIn's uh, enterprise customers, or uh, people with social science, policy background, legal, product, and so forth. Um, and given that complexity, and given that the notions of fairness might evolve over time, we, we designed the systems such that um, uh, the, the technical component accommodates different uh, policy or social choices, social science choices. So we designed the system such that any uh, desired distribution can be given as input to the system and the technical component achieves and ensures that the top rank results reflect that distribution. And of course the first thing we, ha we did was to define measures based on this intuition. Um, because if we do not have measures, we do not, we, there is no way for us to understand the state of the system before this intervention was done and, uh, and also understand the effect of this intervention. Um, so I think I touched upon this, like this just goes into how we compute the desired distribution. In our implementation, we chose uh, the desired distribution to be the distribution of all candidates that match that uh, specific query of the recruiter. Um, so the intuition of uh, the, uh, how we achieve this is very simple. Yeah, it, it is done by a form of re-ranking. So this proceeds in roughly three steps. First, we obtain the set of potential candidates for different uh, uh, protected groups. Uh, so for example, this could be the set of potential candidates that match the query for different uh, values of the gender attribute. And then within each attribute value, say within each gender, we rank the candidates according to the score of the underlying machine learning model. Then we finally perform rank aggregation, wherein we merge the different rank lists, where we achieve a balance between uh, the fairness or representation requirements and ensuring that we select the highest score candidates. And depending on how we uh, choose, uh, how we achieve this uh, merging, we get a few different algorithmic variants. So I'm not going to go into the details. You're, you're welcome to look at the, our KDD 2019 paper for uh, uh, details and the descriptions of, of the algorithms. Um, so given this, we, f we uh, of course, like we wanted to understand how the algorithm is performing. Uh, by, partly by the way we designed the algorithm, we were able to ensure that uh, n nearly all the search results re uh, uh, resulted in representative ranking, meaning that the top results reflected the distribution of the underlying talent pool. Yeah. At the same time, we were um, pleasantly surprised by the fact that there was no impact on business metrics. So in the case of the LinkedIn recruiter tool, the business metrics corresponded to whether a recruiter chose to reach out to a candidate and whether the candidate responded back. So we noticed that there was no uh, statistically observable difference in metrics uh, based on this notion. 
and as a result it made our decision easier to deploy this to all users of uh, linkedin recruiter tool worldwide what did we learn from this so of course the first thing we learned was that um, notions like fairness require collaboration and building consensus across several different stakeholders so we went through several uh, discussions on what no, what notion of fairness should we pick um, what are the different trade offs we we obtained uh, inputs from linkedin's members linkedin's customers and so forth um, and in terms of some of the technical lessons we we observed that in this specific system a post processing re-ranking approach was uh, desirable to be deployed so this has a few benefits uh for one it is agnostic to the choice of the model which means that it can be potentially sc scalable f across different model choices so if say suppose initially the model was based on uh, say uh, yet uh, based on something like xg boost and later on the model is changed to something based on say a deep neural network since this is applied at the very last layer it still uh, it still applies to the new model and and also it acts as a fail safe by this we mean that even if by accident there have been say biases in some of the underlying models by by uh, uh, incorporating this as the very final step we achieve the desired notion irrespective of any possible changes uh, to the underlying model and also in even from a practical perspective it is easier to incorporate as part of existing systems as opposed to um, like uh, modifying the machine learning algorithms itself and of course so uh, let me point out that this does not mean that other types of interventions are uh, not beneficial in fact so such a post processing approach is complementary to uh, approaches for incorporating fairness into the training data or the as part of model training um, so from from this work we we then reflected on what are the uh, broader lessons um, so if you think of fairness uh, in as part of ai life cycle just like explainability we would like to uh, uh, incorporate fairness at all stages of uh, machine learning life cycle this can start with um, even problem formulation um, so you might have come across uh, a recent work that uh, attempted to detect whether somebody is a criminal just based on the photo of the person Uh, this is an example where we need to ask ourselves is an algorithmic approach even an ethical uh, thing to do in fact is it even ethical to start working on a problem like this next when it comes to the time of uh, collecting training data we would like to understand whether the uh, data is sufficiently representative or there biases in the distributions of labels do we need to apply any corrections at this stage um then at the time of model training we uh, it's natural to ask do we need to incorporate constraints on achieving fairness as part of the training or hyperparameter optimization then when it when we are testing the model you know, we would we would want to uh, define metrics for measuring bias and also ensure that the model is fair with respect to these uh, metrics and then at the time of deployment whether it is ab testing or deployment we want to understand the effects of the model across different users are we having unequal effects across different users even if uh, on the whole we resulted in improvement to business metrics um, and of course are we deploying on a model that we did not uh, plan to deploy on the a model uh, are we deploying to a population that is very different from the training or test uh, data uh, population finally are there feedback loops that uh, can cause um, uh, unfair models or unfairness over time um, so these are all dimensions that we, we all should need to think of as we de design uh, uh, such ai systems in practice um so let me acknowledge that uh, the, the work i just briefly mentioned is uh, collaboration with several different uh, folks uh, across different uh, groups at linkedin and this was work that uh, um, uh, i had the opportunity to work on while i was at uh, linkedin uh, let me invite sahin to uh, present present some so far we discussed about fairness from the end user perspective fairness or explainability from an end user perspective sahin is going to uh, go into 
explainability from a model developer angle. So hi everyone, I'm Shine, uh, uh, Shine Gem Geek. Uh, so I worked with Krishnaram on the fairness uh, uh, work that he just presented, uh, and the explainability points that he he pressed on was mostly on you know how can we give the insights to the user of a specific application so that when they see the results of a recommendation they can make sense of it, uh, which was true the diversity product, uh, for example. Now I'm going to go a little bit deeper into talent search. Maybe not too deep, but mostly on how we can do explainability uh, for the engineer's side, for the developer's side. Uh, so I'm going to reiterate on the example uh, or on the application that uh, Krishna also provided, which is the LinkedIn recruiter. It's an enterprise product uh, that recommends candidates uh, to recruiters. So you might be able to go in and you know, search for, let's say, software engineers in New York City, and we would actually return to a ranked set of candidates. Uh, so the recruiter can put standardized or free text criteria. So, and the system does two things. One is it retrieves a set of candidates that are a match to the query. It's, it's, it's somewhat of a neutral match uh, to, the, to the criteria that's provided. But then uh, this set of candidates are ranked at, uh, through multiple levels of machine learning models. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of modeling approaches that we use uh, within the context of this product. We are listing three here. Uh, one is uh, the pairwise uh, XGBoost models, which is basically trying to rank a list uh, based on the likelihood of um, whatever optimization criteria that you're trying to uh, get the highest value for. I think the, the main thing that we use at uh, LinkedIn Recruiter is email accepts, uh, which are basically a recruiter reach out to a can reaching out to a candidate via emails and then the candidate responding uh, positively to them. Uh, the three models we have, one is pairwise, XGBoost, the other one is generalized linear mix models, and the third model that we want to list here is deep neural nets. Um, so for the case of the XGBoost, we have been using some standard definition of uh, feature importance for quite a while now. Uh, so these are, you know, the, in, in the case of XGBoost, the, there are uh, three main points. One is looking at the contribution of the features over multiple trees that are learned. The other one is how descriptive or uh, uh, discriminative these features are, how well they actually separate uh, uh, candidates. And the third one is some kind of coverage metric. Basically, given a candidate or in your training data or test data, what percentage of the candidates would actually touch a specific leaf uh, or a node within the trees. So using these, uh, we can actually look, order, the, order some of the features. I cannot list the features here, of course, uh, due to uh, some privacy issues. But how we use these importance uh, of the features is kind of kind of crucial to our model selection. So the one thing that we want to list here is we do want to understand the feature digressions when a new model is uh, introduced. Potentially, you might be introducing a bug or something may not be working. Uh, and it's, it's very crucial to understand whether we have now changed the importance of a feature that we were using in a previous model heavily, and now it's no longer such a significant uh, feature that we might be using. That, that, that's what one might call digression of feature importance. Uh, furthermore, a very crucial stage at the improvement of a model for the recruiter or any, any machine learning or recommender, uh, machine learning system or recommender system is introducing a new feature and trying to see whether this feature actually means something. You can do some offline analysis to see whether a feature has promise, but once you introduce into the model, you can actually see these importance um, uh, metrics and you can pick and choose which features you want to introduce. For example, if you are if you are coming up with a, something like, of an activity feature, which might be computing this activity properties within the last, let's say, three hours, six hours, 12 or 24 hours, and it could be quite a heavy feature which you have to compute in real time, do you really want to introduce all of those? Or maybe you might actually go uh, you know, just for the last six hours or even 24 hours so that you could actually reduce the computation. Uh, also, you want to understand whether a feature that you introduced caused an improvement in the model that you might be seeing, or whether it was something else, it could be a new labeling strategy or data source, you can check whether the order between features have changed. 
uh, and the shortcoming of such a method is actually it's, it's, it's just a global view. It doesn't give you a more singular view of the of the system where for a specific uh, recommendation whether something is not working right, uh, this kind of an overview of feature importance may not be the best choice. The second thing that the second model we want to list here is the generalized linear mix models. These are these are inherently personalized models in, and explicitly personalized models, meaning that uh, we have a global linear model uh, which kind of explores the relationship between a metric like in mail except with, with different features, but you would also be learning different linear models for each and every entity in the system, if you can, if there is enough data for it. These entities could be, let's say, per recruiter, we could understand the preferences of the recruiter. It could be per contract, which could be construed as like a set of recruiters. It could be per user as well. So basically, this would be personalized models trying to understand the preferences of the users and the recruiters. Um, it learns quite a lot of parameters, but all, it, all in all, for an example, for a single case of a recruiter and a, a member uh, being recommended, uh, it is explainable, meaning that you get a single linear model, so you can see the ways of the features that are being applied for this case. So we are not going to get too much deep on the uh, explainability issues with, with such, a linear, such linear models. Uh, the final model that we want to introduce here is just basically deep neural nets. And they are not very, you know, uh, interpretable models uh, by nature. They, there could be multiple layers, multiple feature interactions that you want to uh, understand how, how things work and whether a score that you give to a candidate, which features were the biggest uh, contributors to it. Um, and we utilize the integrated gradients that Ankur also introduced in, in his uh, use case. Um, uh, but and in the case of recruiter, uh, we are faced with the question of what's the baseline example. Maybe for a figure, uh, for a picture, you could have like a completely dark picture as the baseline uh, example. But at least for the case of recruiter, we thought of can we actually come up with baseline examples uh, per each query because, you know, because every query creates its own features uh, based on the match between a candidate and the query. Uh, and so it would be better for us to actually uh, choose one of the candidates uh, for the query as a baseline uh, example. So this is, this is the method that you know, we utilize for the integrated gradients approach uh, for recruiter. Uh, for each query, we rank examples and we choose one baseline and we can choose this baseline based on, let's say, the, the lowest ranked candidate, a K percentile candidate or a random candidate, or it could actually be something as simple as a recruiter comes to you or an engineer comes what was the, and asks what was the reason that you ranked this candidate about this other candidate and you need to be able to give the results. This is just an example. Again, we are somewhat uh, obfuscating the feature names, but it kind of looks similar to the case of XGBoost, but rather this is in a case-by-case -case way, and you know, this is just uh, another uh, view of the same phenomena where you can actually have negative contributions, meaning that a candidate might actually get a negative contribution from a feature compared to another candidate, could actually get lower ranked, but then other, other, other features might actually be helping in. So there are some pros and cons, of course, with every explainability method. Uh, this uh, integrated gradients uh, can actually, you know, potentially explain very complex models. And for our case, uh, we utilize it for the deep learned models. And it's, a, it's good because it gives you a case-by-case -case analysis. It, it gives the exact answer to a question, why was this candidate ranked compared to another candidate for, for this specific query by the recruiter. And it's good for debugging real-time problems because, you know, the model could be quite complicated, but in the end of it all, you can see whether a specific, let's say if there, there was a bug in the feature generation of one of the features, you could actually understand what was going on. Uh, it's, it's a bit costly compute because it's, it's for each and every uh, comparison between the baseline and a candidate, you have to take, the, the, take some approximation of the integrated gradient. Uh, but, you know, that, that can be done in a case-by-case -case analysis. Of course, the global view in this case is missing. Uh, so we have given a d differentiation between the global explanations and case-by-case -case explanations. Uh, and for the case of XGBoost, we have been using the global, but in the case of deep neural net, we have mostly 
kind of switched into a case-by-case -case explanation case, which worked well for us uh, because uh, we, it gave us intuitive results uh, and describing score differences. Uh, basically, what was of note that in the feature attribution, we have specifically seen two kinds of attributions. One was directly towards optimizing the criteria such as an email accept. You could directly see why one feature was attributed more because it was highly correlated with uh, events such as email accept, as well as certain features which would actually show the match of the uh, query to the candidate. So that was, that was quite intuitive for us. Um, so the next case study that I want to give is uh, the combined work of Jile Yang, Wei Di, and Song Da Guo uh, at LinkedIn. And actually, this is an interesting case study which, which gives the application of explainability in improvement uh, business goals. Rather than just improving a machine learning model or understanding where a machine uh, learning model might go uh, wrong, uh, we can actually utilize the explanations uh, to, to improve a business goal, which I will be explaining. And the, 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 the main case for us is the business to business sales predictions. So let's set the problem of the business to business uh, sales prediction. Uh, basically what it tries to understand is, given a set of features for a company, uh, how it, well it was performing, uh, you know, the properties of the company, you know, the cost of the contract, and which we are trying to actually predict whether uh, the company will upsell or, uh, you know, churn. Basically, will we actually keep the contract or whether it will be renewed, it will be renewed uh, with more, with a higher price. Uh, so we are looking at two things here in terms of the attribution uh, of, the, of the features to the outcome. One is the top driver fe uh, features that cause the current situation, which we call uh, the feature contributors. Basically, given the current condition of the company's likelihood to churn or upsell, what were the features that actually caused this? Uh, and the second is, what could we perturb? What, can, what kind of features can we change so that we can actually get a better result? Or what kind of features that we should be careful uh, that if they get, you know, kind of, let's say, lower or higher, that we could, we, we could significantly impact the likelihood of churn or upsell? So this is one example, again, this is the, the upsell or the churn example for the LinkedIn career page. So a company comes and the, the career page is like basically where you can uh, set up jobs and you know, uh, kind of, and these jobs would be recommended to the candidates and you would get some, uh, the, the value for the, for the money you spent uh, by getting applications, getting views, etc. And you know, you can actually, the, the big uh, intuition that we want to give here is uh, feature contributors and feature influencers could be completely different, meaning that from zero to the to current situation, there could be multiple features uh, providing some input to what happens right now, but that doesn't mean that this relationship holds on uh, the features that gave the most contribution so far. We cannot just increase them or decrease them along, along their current dimensions and get the same results. Potentially different features might act based on what stage we are right now. So that also means that influencers and uh, contributors could be completely different features with different impacts. So uh, the, the process that we did here is similar to Lime. Actually, we call it XLIME, and I'll, I'll be talking about that in a bit. But just before that, let's kind of revisit Lime. Uh, basically, what Lime does is um, it learns a linear model around the vicinity uh, of, a, of, of the current point, let's say for the current company uh, that we are trying to predict. And it's learning different weights for different features. And a, a feature uh, that has a high, high weight would mean in this case is that if I just increase this feature a bit, you know, we would actually be increasing the score of the, of the, of the model. And this would be the feature influence. Uh, but on the other hand, the feature contributors along this uh, discussion would be the multiplication of the feature values with the feature rates, and that's what Lime would call a, a feature contribution, at least by its definition. Now, we use what we call XLIME at LinkedIn, which improves upon Lime along two domains. One is the piecewise linear regression, and the other one is localized certified sampling, which we will get into now. Uh, so piecewise linear regression is actually based on 
not exactly, but implicitly learning actually two models for each and every point, two linear models, whereas these linear models are actually combined in a single model, which, which says that for each and every feature, we learn two weights. One weight is where this feature gets increased, which is basically a weight along the positive dimension of the current feature value, and the other one is a, a weight along the negative uh, dimension of the uh, uh, negative direction of the current feature. So basically, this just means that we set up uh, the learning uh, uh, learning problem uh, by for, for each point. We create two features. One is if it's it's larger than the current value uh, for a point, then we actually just get that value and assign it the way the positive feature rate, and hence the negative feature rate would actually be just alluding to a feature value with zero, we would not be using it. But then for, a fee, for another point in the vicinity of the current point, we would actually, uh, if, it's a, if it's lower than the current feature value, we would just be applying the negative weight. And we would learn these, these, these weights. Basically, these weights mean that if I go into negative and if a beta negative in this case is high, that means that I would actually be giving quite a large penalty. Uh, but if, if beta positive is not super high, that means that if I increase this feature, uh, you know, in regards to decreasing it, in, increasing may not actually give as much advantage as the decreasing would give disadvantage. So that's basically doing this kind of distinction. So what's the impact? Uh, actually, the impact is changing completely the, the definitions of the contributor and inclusion features. Uh, a, the contributor feature for the x line would be that it would be the feature values multiplied with the negative betas because that would mean that this feature actually came from zero to this value, so therefore we would actually look at look at the negative side. And for the feature influencer, we would look at uh, two 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 weights. If a feature has a, a large uh, magnitude of negative uh, beta minus or a positive beta plus. That means that it would have a positive influence if we, uh, if we increase its value. Uh, and negative uh, feature influencer is a similar, uh, similar uh, way if you use a negative beta plus or positive beta minus. Uh, the second thing that we want to introduce is local, localized certified sampling. The idea is basically trying to get better points in the vicinity. Uh, by uh, getting the empirical distribution of points for the, for the current point that we are trying to explain. So the example here is, especially in, in, in consideration to Lyme, is that what Lyme does, it, it has a distribution over points um, and it weighs, weighs these points. If, it's, if a point is close to the current point, it would weigh high in learning the linear model. Uh, whereas for x line we do not weigh points, but rather what we do is we try to get points close and cl closer and closer to the current point by looking at the empirical distribution at the current point. So these are, this is the summary of the differences. One is the weighted linear, uh, one is the linear regression uh, for uh, x line versus the weighted linear regression. Uh, but again, our, our, our regression case we use piecewise method, and when choosing the points while Lyme chooses points from, from, from all the domain but weighs them, we actually choose around the, around the current point. So the one, uh, the, the, the application that we want to list here is we just chose the uh, subset of the companies for the LinkedIn career page and around 117 uh, features uh, that we try to estimate with whether there is going to be a churn or an upsell. Um, so this is just an anecdotal example which gives uh, the difference between Lime and X-Lime where for us, uh, you know, the contributors were completely different because contributors in the case of X-Lime actually came from how this feature changed the current value of the uh, upsell or churn probability from the case when it was zero to the current value. Whereas for Lime, it just, it, it computes the linear uh, model around the vicinity and a single linear model. This is the difference of piecewise learning. Um, we also give uh, results on how well we choose the contributors, uh, feature contributors. So we, uh, we give three explanation curves. Basically, 
the explanation curves, what it does is for each and every example, we, we utilize uh, X lime or lime to find the feature contributors, and we choose the top K feature contributors and uh, learn, learn the model again using the same model choice. For, for our case, we are using a, uh, XGBoost based model. So if you choose every feature and you don't filter any features based on the feature contribution, the, all the models would actually perform uh, well, and that's what we see. But rather choosing the models carefully based on the feature contribution, we see that with XLIME we were able to choose more uh, descriptive uh, feature contributors, hence the model that learned with the, with the subset of the features actually performed well uh, for XLIME compared to LIME. Um, this is another anecdotal example just to show the feature influencers where, the, again, as we said, feature influencer and the feature uh, contributor are chosen in, a, in somewhat of a similar way. For XLIME, whereas for, uh, for, for LIME, whereas for XLIME, we choose based on the piecewise linear regressions output, based on how it weighs the negative side of the feature versus the positive side of the feature. So here are some key takeaways. Uh, we believe it helped us separating uh, the distinction between contributor and influencer features. Uh, and influencer features especially helps a model or helps uh, the business case to improve on, on, on uh, something like an uh, upsell uh, probability, whereas for contributor we just understand which features cause the current uh, behavior. Uh, and we introduce XLIME, which, which improves upon the LIME uh, by using the piecewise linear regression and localized stratified sampling. And it, 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 from the results, it shows that it, it, it's able to capture the important features in a better manner. Uh, so I'm going to give the mic back to Ankur. He's going to give a couple of case studies before closing the talk. So. Hi. <coughs> so in the interest of time, I'll go a bit quicker on these. So the, the previous case studies I, de I described was somewhat negative where we were finding problems with uh, on models and trying to attack them and break them. Uh, this, these are going to be more positive where we put, we, we put explainability to good use. So <coughs> this one is about using uh, integrated gradients to explain diabetic retinopathy predictions in order to assist doctors. So diabetic retinopathy is a complication of diabetes that affects the eyes. Uh, if it's really serious, it could be vision threatening. Uh, typically, when doctors grade for diabetic retinopathy, there are five levels, none, mild, medium, severe, and proliferative. Proliferative is, is vision threatening. So now, I think a couple of years, uh, three years back, uh, there was a deep learning model based on CNN's build uh, that achieved state-of-the-art performance on detecting, uh, detecting this disease from retinal scans. Uh, so now, uh, can we use in explanations uh, to assist doctors in better grading uh, these predictions? So the answer is yes. So in this, you can apply the same integrated gradients method to highlight regions of the image that correspond to the disease. And in this case, they turn out to be real patho pathologies. So, uh, so what we find in this uh, proliferative DR example is that it highlights these lesions and uh, those little blood vessels in the, op in the optic disc, which, are, which is called neovascularization, which is quite bad. So, so, this, so we confirmed these findings with ophthalmologists, and then this, they agreed that the, the model is indeed picking up on relevant features. OK, so now we want to know, <coughs> can attributions in general help doctors uh, be more accurate in their predictions? So there's the, there's the doctor by, by herself. There's the doctor plus the model, and then there's the doctor plus the model plus the explanation. So how does the overall accuracy of this human plus doctor, the doctor plus model system uh, vary? So for that, we ran a, a clinical study with 10 ophthalmologists, uh, four of whom were retinal specialists and five were both certified ophthalmologists. We had three experimental arms, one in which the doctor just grades the image, the second one, the doctor grades the image in light of the model predictions. So, the, so we are told that the model says this is severe DR, and then the doctor grades. And in the third one, the doctor sees the model's prediction plus that explanation and the image, and then grades. So we had interesting findings. So the positive ones were uh, 
assistance is available in B and C, and that significantly improves the doctor's accuracy. So having the predictions available and the explanations available was a good thing to the doctors. Uh, both forms of assistance improve sensitivity without hurting specificity. So the true positive rate, the recall went up uh, without hurting false positive rate. The negative findings were that explanations can improve accuracy in cases where there was DR, but it actually hurt accuracy in cases where there was no DR. So if, you have, if the original image has no diabetic retinopathy, then the doctor is probably better off not seeing the explanations. This is because the explanations then have the risk of misleading the doctor because they'll highlight something and that might mislead the doctor into thinking, oh, maybe there is something here that I didn't see. And lastly, uh, another negative finding is that with both B and C, the doctor model agreement increased. So with assistance, the doctor's predictions largely matched the model's predictions. So this is, this is hinting at over-reliance on part of the doctors, and this varied by the doctor's seniority. So the more senior the doctors were, the less they relied on the model. Uh, the more junior doctors sort of heavily relied on the model. Uh, so we had this study published in the Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, okay, so last five, ten minutes, I'll spend on telling you about what we're doing at Fiddler. So, so we are trying to build an explainable AI engine. The mission of the company is uh, trust, visibility, and insights for all, uh, for all machine learning models. So what Fiddler is, you, it's like uh, you bring your own data, you bring your own model, you put them into Fiddler and out comes explanations. So to make this more concrete, imagine you're a bank, you have a credit lending model that you have, uh, that you use to sort of uh, decide on uh, credit line increase requests. Right. So you can put this model into Fiddler and then you'll get an explanation like this for every, uh, for every input. So on the left hand side is the input. So this user has, this customer has a FICO of 790, has a salary of 89,000, is requesting a credit of 9,000, and so on. On the right-hand side, you see attributions. The blue bars indicate positive contributions. The red bars indicate negative contributions. Uh, these attributions are not using integrated gradients. They're using, uh, they're based on Shapley values, which is another popular method for explaining machine learning models. Uh, up top is the prediction. So the prediction is, is 0.3. So now with this kind of interface, you can immediately notice certain things, right? So, so you see that zip code and school have negative contributions. So why is that? So it turns out in this particular model, they are playing a proxy to gender. Uh, specifically, this school, Salem College, is actually a women's only college. And so that's a proxy to gender that the model is using, which the interface helps you catch. The other thing you can do is, so you notice these sliders at the input. So you can, you can sort of move them around. You can fiddle with them, hence the name of the company, Fiddler. So you can fiddle with the inputs and, uh, and then sort of the, you can see prediction, what the model's prediction is at these counterfactual points. Uh, you can also, you can change the input and also regenerate the explanation. So how does it reason on this? You know, what if income increased by 10%? Now what is the explanation? Uh, the other thing you can do is you can sort of use Fiddler as an explanations engine for an ops workflow. So imagine you are a customer support agent at, um, you know, for, a, for a fraud model or for a lending model. So you have some interface to handle cases. You know, these are all the cases where a customer is complaining. You know, why was I marked fraud as fraud or why was my loan denied? So <clears throat> you could use Fiddler to enhance that workflow with explanations. You can see for every case, you have all the case information, plus you have the model's explanations, and then you can, the, hopefully the, 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 the loan officer or the fraud officer uh, can be more productive by having the model explanations with him or her. Uh, so I'll skip this part on what Shapley values are. This is classic stuff. Let's move on to other things that Fiddler has. So another thing we have is a slice and explain. So the previous interface was for understanding individual predictions. We can move on to, we, can al we also offer explanations for regions uh, of the data set through this interface called slice and explain. The idea is you slice a part of your data set, 
using SQL. So you can write a SQL query saying, you know, show me all inputs where the income is greater than 100,000 and the state is California. Then for those inputs, so then you get this table uh, with, 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 with row, where each row is an input in that slice. Now you can individually explain these examples. So you can click explain and you get that interface over there again. But you can also do other things. So you can, you can look at the feature distributions in this slice. You know, how is the income distributed? How are the predictions distributed? Uh, you can compute aggregate explanations. So let's take all the Shapley values and average them and see you know, what are the, on an average, how much, what is the contribution of every feature? You can contrast these average contributions across slices. So you can do the, you can do a slice on, you know, show me all the males. Now watch the average contrib, you know, the top highest average contributor. You can see the size of females, and again ask that, compare the the top contributor there. Uh, another interesting thing is you can query on attributions. So, for instance, um, in a lending model, let's say income is typically the top contributing feature. So you can write a query, show me all examples where the attribution to income is quite low. So these examples ought to be interesting. You know, income typically gets a large amount of blame, but there is a slice in my data set where it's not getting enough blame. So what's going on there? Another thing uh, that Fiddler offers is model monitoring. So we can hook into a production model and then uh, offer these offer a time series chart of all the predictions coming out from the model, uh, the feature distribution, and then we can measure drift between the, la the feature distribution within live traffic in contrast with the distribution in training. Uh, you can, it'll flag outliers for you, so which are the, the, the top highest or the top lowest, most egregious predictions. And then you can explain individual outliers. You know, so, so the system will tell you, you know, this prediction looks a bit odd. It's 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 not typically in the range of what we see. So then you can click on it, and you can you can then compute these attributions and try to understand what's going on. Uh, and then we are sort of headed towards, you know, sort of filling out all the bubbles in this wheel. So far, what we have is the prediction and the monitoring some of the QA bubble filled out, but then there's lots more work to be done. You know, can we use, so there is explainability during training. Uh, can I use uh, attributions to understand what features to add to my model, what features to remove, how can I engineer better features? Uh, the holy grail here is, you know, we find all these problems that the model is relying on irrelevant features or there is a certain relevant feature that the, the model is not picking up on. Now, how do you fix these issues? So that's really, you know, the, the, the last bit here, which is the hardest part, on how do we go from problems to auto and automatically fixing the models. Uh, all right, so that's, this is the last slide. Uh, I wanted to leave you with some challenges and trade-offs. So, so one, cha one engineering challenge with explainability is um, if you want to build a, sort of a model explainability system, you have to interface with a variety of models. And this is like the ecosystem of machine learning models is massive. There's, there are lots of frameworks, as TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Scikit, and so on. And so you, know, you need to be able to, to understand and interface with all these models. Secondly, uh, the stakeholders of explainability varies. So, so at least there are three primary stakeholders. So end users care. They want to know why was this prediction made. Model developers care. They want to know, in general, how is my model reasoning? And then regulators care. So in regulated industries like, like finance and banking, the regulators want to know, you know, how is your, uh, what's the risk profile of your model? Is it fair or not? Now, they are all sort of in the umbrella of explainability, but the specific questions are different. You know, end users want individual prediction explanations. Model developers want to understand how the model is doing overall. What are the blind spots of this model? What are regions of error? The regulators want a bit of both. Also, the, the form factor of the explanation may vary. End users may want something that they can easily sort of grok. Model developers may be interested in the various charts and PDP plots and so on. Uh, another complication here is that there, is, there are a variety of explain, explainability algorithms. Uh, the hardest part of explainability research is the eval. It's, it's hard to evaluate these algorithms. There's no real ground truth for explainability. You know, it's, you, you're given a black box and you're trying to explain it. But what's a good answer? That's unclear. Uh, 
which is why methods like Shapley values are popular because they have an axiomatic justification that they satisfy certain useful properties. But even there, in recent work, we studied <coughs> uh, different Shapley value-based explanations that are all supposed to be axiomatically unique, yet we found that all of them differ in the attributions they, they yield. So there, e even in applying Shapley values, there are certain design choices that you make. And those design choices can significantly affect what the end attributions would be. And then finally, there are trade-offs between explainability, performance, privacy, fairness. Uh, you know, to give an example, you might have safety critical or mission critical tasks where performance trumps explainability. An example is a health monitor that's trying to predict whether you're going to have a stroke. For this kind of model, perhaps you want the model to do as well as it can in terms of prediction. Uh, and people may be willing to, to use a model that, is very, that has very high predictive accuracy, uh, but is not very intelligible, uh, that it's not very interpretable. So there are, there are these trade-offs on how do you balance performance with, with explainability. All right, so with that, we are happy to take questions. Thank you, everyone. Questions? Yeah. We have no planted questions here, so. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, uh, so the organizers told us to make this announcement. So when you go out for coffee, please don't leave your laptops or bags over here. Uh, it's not safe.